And we're live. So uh, I'm Craig Dunn. I'm a recovering oil and gas geologist. Uh, it's been seven years renewable, and uh, I'm doing OK. <laughs> so first off, how many of you guys are even familiar with the concept of geothermal energy? Oh, that's more than most. So that's great news. Normally, I give this presentation, and nobody knows that I'm not putting in heat pumps. So we're going to start with there. I have an opportunity that I've been working on for a very long time. Uh, I work in the geothermal energy sector. Uh, it's all about earth heat. Now, when we say geothermal, most of us think volcanoes and heat flow and lava. Um, and for me, I think the biggest issue I'm trying to get around for people from an education perspective is that our planet is a giant heat battery. It is more energy than we will ever possibly use. The joke is, is that the sun will burn out before we run out of earth heat. Now, when we talk about renewable energy, most of us think wind and solar, but we're forgetting that a huge chunk of our carbon taxable energy is from things like natural gas on the heating side. And so what we've moved forward with in the geothermal energy development is to understand how do you monetize heat? What is the best possible ways of making uh, an amazing heat resource into a cash flow environment? And the short answer to this is food. And how many things can you make with heat for food? Pretty much everything. And that's one of the best parts. So when we started this project, we were looking at an electricity development. We were looking at selling power to BC Hydro at one of Canada's top geothermal energy areas. And this town is a beautiful town called Valemont. How many people have been to Valemont? Oh, you're, well, she works for me. That doesn't count. This is probably one of the prettiest towns in all of Canada. It's about an hour west of Jasper, and it is sitting along something that we call the Rocky Mountain Trench. Uh, geologically, it's probably pretty boring. It's the edge of a former craton, but in reality, it's the heat resource that gives us both Fairmont and the Radium Hot Springs. It extends hundreds of kilometers, and right here, this little hot spring here, is actually one of the hottest hot springs in Canada. So geologically, this is for me, as an exploration geologist, this is, this is money. This is an incredible resource. We're thinking that we could develop power structures that look in comparison to places like California, N Oregon, Nevada, places that have already developed a power structure. But what we found is that the community was loving the idea of using their heat resource for something else. So when things started to slowly change in our industry, we're seeing things like the Paris and oil pricing. We have two new elections in the last year that I can't get my head around. Um, but what we're actually looking at is that our little geothermal project, while all this was happening, slowly got more and more exposure. People are like, hey, that heat thing, tell me about that, Craig. And this was a great opportunity to the point where people are starting to approach us and saying, hey, can you, can you do a fish farm like that one in Oregon? Can I grow shrimp and make it organic and get Vancouver Aquarium to approve of this stuff? I'm like, well, absolutely. So we had customers that are coming to us, and with that, the community support. Now, why am I so giddy about this geothermal resource? Because when I worked in heavy oil, and I worked in the Bakken, and I worked in all these other plays, I was always chasing a resource that would always run out. No matter how good I was, that reservoir was going to run out. So when I look at a place like this, where the earth heat resource is incredibly long term, it is base load renewable energy. So the idea of base load means that you turn your lights on, those lights go on. And they go on when it's sunny, and when it's winds blowing, and when it's night, and when it's cold outside, because our planet is acting as that energy battery. So in the last decade, I've spent a good chunk of my career getting really good at finding heat. And this one was a no-brainer. This is actually taken a month ago, I think illegally. Oops. They're not actually supposed to dig a hole where they are swimming in close to 50 degree water at surface. To get 50 degree water where I'm standing, I'm going to drill almost two kilometers. This is happening right at surface, and my permit area starts right there. This resource is an incredible opportunity for exploration. So great heat resource, that's great, Craig, but how do I turn that into cash? How do I turn that into sellable tomatoes? So the answer is, is that we're looking at bringing on, and we've already started this, of developing a heat park. In this 250 acre area, we have about 50 acres that the Valemont Community Forest is working with us to actually provide heat to a number of greenhouse, aquaculture, ecotourism destinations, even educational facilities. We've already signed on a number of parties to help us develop this eco park. Now, the short answer is this, Craig, you don't know anything about greenhouses, do you? That's not true. I love what they make. 
I love the food that comes out of them. But the answer is I'm a heat expert. So what I did is we created with Borealis is an opportunity for those customers to buy heat off us at a discount to natural gas. Who are these guys? Well, I'd like to say that we thought of this idea of a geo heat park ourselves, but really, it's, is that? Okay. At the end of the day, we actually stole this idea from some of the best in the world. This project on the bottom is in the UK. It's the Eden Project. This one, the Haku Farm in uh, New Zealand, they get people to, sh to actually fish for shrimp as a tourist destination where they serve it to you. It's all heated off the back of the geothermal power plant in, in New Zealand. And then this last one, we're looking at industrial grade applications. So we've already signed up a great deal of the customer base. We're very excited about that. Um, and then the future sales is dictated on a very, very small scale. So our development is actually a heat project that is small enough that we're going to be using about a tenth of our geothermal resource from one well. When we start to develop the larger project, the scale of this gets pretty dramatic. I'm going to keep this slide short because all of our local fossil fuels, this is a funny concept. It's $2 a gigajoule to buy natural gas, but to get it to your house, it's closer to 9 to 10. People don't get this. $2, $2 a gigajoule, Craig, you'll never beat that. That's true. I won't. But if you're going to sit next to the natural gas plant, sure, that's a good deal. But the point is, is we can beat this by up to 20%. And the longer our projects go, we're hoping to sign 10 and 20 year heat contracts. We can't know the price of oil next week, but I can tell a client who's growing tomatoes that I'm going to give you your heat price for the next 15 to 20 years. The structure of those deals are very, very exciting for our customer base. And I'm not even going to get into this. There's a few engineers who know that this is just a bad idea. When you convert electricity back into heat, the efficiency tanks. So I'm not even going to compete with those guys. This is one of my uh, favorite slides because I get to tell everyone that Allison, Allison, give a little wave, just got appointed to the um, Alberta Innovates Super Board. So if you guys are all finished that, guys across the thing, they merged all the ones and they decided that Allison, who's one of our principals, is qualified enough in this tech space slash energy development uh, to actually be one of the leaders for Alberta in innovation. Uh, I've been at this a very long time. Anders is another one. Our board of directors is, is off the charts. We have guys like Dr. Alan Jessup, who actually ran the geothermal energy department in 1982. Uh, he wrote more reports on this type of resource development before I was even born. Um, and then we have a number of others that if you're more than happy to go through. I think the important part is not what I'm telling you about ourselves. It's the fact that we've already gotten STTC funding. We've already received IRAP funding. We've already received a number of international firsts. Uh, specifically, one of the very first companies, or the very first company, to win a permit for geothermal in the Northwest Territories. At the end of the day, this is about a million and a half dollar project. This is just one project. When we start to move forward, you know, 10, 20 year contracts. What we're actually looking at is that when we start to develop the power project to this, this thing expands dramatically. So again, we're using a small percentage of the heat from the reservoir. As we start to develop the power project, then we move it even further. This is just one. We also own a permit in Terrace, BC. And then the last part of this is that I worked in the oil patch a long time. There's over 500,000 wells across the Western Canadian Basin. Do you know what we use the heat for heat for? Nothing. Every once in a while, there's a co-produced fluids project, but using waste heat from the oil patch to make renewable energy, we are currently building that model at Canoe Reach so that we can expand that model throughout the entire Western Canadian market. So your cherries from tomato could be literally grown in Medicine Hat. The structure of this company, <laughs> talk about skin in the game. Uh, we're a privately held company. We paid our bills doing uh, exploration and consulting for other companies in Canada and globally. Um, but what it allowed us to do is to bootstrap our own projects. So if you want to talk about you know, am I invested in this? <laughs> Just ask my wife. Um, the short answer to this, we have two drill-ready projects, um, and with a little bit more policy change that we're seeing coming down the pipe, both federally and provincially, thanks to some of the work from the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association, we're about to see this geothermal market crack wide open. The ask is pretty simple. Our project design is about 5.5 million for Valmont. We've already put in uh, about 1.4, I think, to date. Um, we're looking at other locations. I'm quite happy, Allison has had led this one as well, is that we are hopefully going forward with our seed ups campaign in the next month. Um, we'll be one of the only brick and mortar uh, style operations in the energy sector and specifically in renewable on that campaign. So there's our ATB. They're welcome, Sandy. That should get a vote, shouldn't it? Um, <laughs> 
I was there. Oh, devastating. Um, the goal for us is to finish out our exploration. We have a few more spots that we want to triple check, um, but then moving right into the slim hole program, which gives us our heat resource. This is the best part. Does anyone know why this is relevant in today's drilling market? Yeah, we're at like 82% sit rate. So the drilling rigs that I would use to drill this, this economic model changed dramatically in the last 18 months. I'm happy to say that our drilling costs have come down anywhere from 40 to 70%, depending on what we're looking at. So yeah, time to drill. At the end of the day, I am pitching that you guys invest in renewable energy development and better food, food you can eat rather than ship. So please support Borealis, and uh, thanks for your time. have to answer questions. Maybe it's a silly question. How do you transfer heat? Yeah, very good question. Um, the well design, we actually transfer heat each and every day in the, in the oil patch. Uh, the short answer is water. So our formation is not only hot. Uh, geologically, I need a formation that is hot and fractured or permeable. So what happens is I re-inject the cold water down, it permeates through that reservoir, and then it propagates back up. The advantage is, is that I if I do it correctly, I can actually get that system to run in indefinitely. Um, and that's a whole lot of geophysics and reservoir modeling. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the water that acts as a medium for heat transfer. Until somebody, unless somebody in the room, tech guy, has uh, a graphene. No, nobody's got a graphene no. background. OK, thermal. Ballistic. So it becomes a closed system. You don't have to add water every nope. single time nope. find a water we, source. We get that question a lot. Is It's actually a lot of water that moves through that system, but all the water does is acts as a transfer. And then uh, across the utility itself, it would have a uh, direct heat transfer, which allows us to use a very, very benign water through the loop to feed all of our customer base. The disadvantage to geothermal is I can't ship it like tens of kilometers. So I have to make sure that my customer base is right there, which is what we've done with the heat park. Uh, what sort of structure do your heat contracts look like with people? Um, how do you, are they structured as uh, options to buy heat or? Uh, they're structured as an agreement to buy X number of gigajoules per year. It's a thermal contract. Uh, and then anything over that minimum value gets you a price point. Anything below gets you another price point. And it, we also have a contract agreement uh, that we're working on that allows us to be able to uh, higher quality heat. So if somebody, the brewery for instance, uh, that wants 90 or 120 degree heat, they'll pay a slightly different price than the guy who's keeping tree seedlings warm. Right? So that allows us to maximize our resource potential or sellability, I guess. Cascading as it's called in the industry. A few engineers. Thank you so much. That was easy. Good job.